Outriders is here and we've been playing it quite a bit thanks to getting some early access from Square Enix. So there's a lot to learn about this one. If you're curious and you're thinking about diving in this weekend, we got 10 tips for you. Let's just get right into it with number 10. The round skills are actually really good. There are these round skills in the game that apply effects to your bullets. They're pretty useful in general for obvious reasons, but there is something about them that isn't quite so obvious. The biggest thing is the fact that these skills also refill your ammo when activated, which in some cases can actually be more useful than the regular effect that the skill applies. That means that if you want to apply a round skill like toxic or, you know, the, the fire rounds just before you're about to run out of ammo, then you've effectively doubled the amount of ammo in that weapon's clip. So for SMGs, this probably won't be something you're going to be using all the time, but for weapons with small clips that take a while to reload, especially the shotguns and the auto shotguns or sniper rifles, this could be really useful. Just keep an eye on this bar to the right of the reticle when you aim down the sights. That's your ammo count, so for certain encounters, it's helpful to activate a round skill just as that bar is about to run out. There's a lot of little tiny things like this that really can improve your play style that you'll pick up on as you play. Next at number nine, just some good stuff to know about melee abilities. Melee attacks can be really effective in this game, depending on how you use them. Regardless of your class, the two melee attacks are the same. There's the standard standing attack that hits in kind of like a cone projecting outward and applies a specific effect depending on your class. So it has burn for pyromancers, freeze for technomancers, and etc. etc. And then there's also a slam attack that is activated when you do melee from a sprint. Now the standard melee attack has its uses, it's pretty damn good and effective, but we're just gonna come out and say it, the slam is crazy good. It doesn't just hit in a wider area effect than the standard melee, it also does more damage and just has a better chance of interrupting enemies and apply those status effects. Basically, it's just all around better, uh, with the only downside being the fact that it takes slightly long to trigger because you gotta get in some of a sprint. You don't even need to build up to it though, uh, just start sprinting for like a split second and mash the melee button and you can do it. Like with all the melee attacks, there's a short interruption so you can't just spam them, but with the right timing you can easily perform a slam, shoot an enemy in the head, then follow up with a standard melee. It's basically kind of like a combo and it can be incredibly effective against certain heavily armed armored enemies who are resistant to bullets. For the trickster class, melee can be a bit of a double-edged sword. You know, their melee is especially good because they just start out with passive bonus melee damage by default, but their melee also has a chance to apply slow. Normally, that's great for your regular chump enemies, but for bosses, that can, it can actually be a problem as any slow ability counts as an interrupt, and using too many interrupt abilities on a boss causes them to build up effect resistance. We'll talk about how resistance works a little bit later. It took us a long time to figure out, but uh, to make a long story short, it can make things a little bit more difficult for you. In general, though, it's in your best interest to be doing melee attacks as much as possible unless you're playing as a Technomancer, as they're a lot more effective at long range. Still, when melee attacks are required, regardless of the class, use slam as much as possible. It's just generally better than the regular close range attacks. Now over at number eight, let's talk about those boss tips. Bosses and elite enemies are probably gonna be the biggest stumbling block for people. Uh, these can be pretty difficult if you don't come into them prepared. If you're playing one of the squishier classes like the Pyromancer, then bosses can be quite an issue, but we got a couple of tips. Doing critical damage is generally seemingly really important when fighting bosses. In most cases, you get critical damage when shooting them in the head. So regardless of your weapon, you're gonna wanna aim at their head. This is video game 101 usually. This is actually a case where the really aggressive auto-targeting on a controller can be a bit of a detriment as it will default to aiming at the exact center of the enemy. So you'll want to either disable auto-aim, which might be more trouble than it's worth, or just practice immediately tilting your controller up to an enemy in the head after aiming them. Obviously, if you're playing on PC, this is no big deal. You don't even think about this stuff, but just so you know. Now, with a little practice, doing this will be like second nature in no time. It's really something you need to do for every enemy. Another thing for bosses, though, it's very important to not load up on too many interrupt attacks, like we mentioned earlier. Hitting a boss with the types of attacks that either immobilize or interrupt them too quickly will fill up their resistance bar. That's really bad because at a certain point, being able to interrupt a boss's special attacks is absolutely essential if you want to survive. 
Certain classes get bonuses against elite enemies, and any of these skills are great to have for obvious reasons, so keep an eye out for them in the skill trees. Remember, you can respec the points in your tree at any time, so if you're really struggling, then just reallocate some of those points towards taking out elites, then just switch them back to when you kill them. That's kind of crazy, but hey, if you want to min-max like that, you can. If you're playing solo, probably the best class for dealing with bosses and elites is the Technomancer, because this is the class that can feel a little underpowered at first, but it's honestly really, really good after you get a few more skills under your belt. The biggest thing that makes it good for bosses is just how it heals. Technomancer is the only class that gets healing just for damage rather than from getting kills, so it's a class ideal for taking on a single target. Next at number seven, how to escape from certain status effects. There's a lot of status effects in the game and many of them you can actually break out of or in some way negate that isn't obvious at all. The most obvious one to remove is burn. That's the status effect where you're on fire. So of course, how do you escape from it? guess what? You stop, drop, and roll. A toxic is also fairly straightforward to deal with. Any healing effect removes it. Two of the most annoying status effects, though, are Ash and Frozen, which can kind of lock you in place or slow you for a while. It's actually possible to escape from them by performing a melee attack. Now, the most unexpected way to get out of a status effect applies to Bleed. Bleed does constant damage over time, like you'd expect, and like poison-like abilities in other games, you'd think you would just have to deal with it, but no, in this game, you can avoid taking damage from bleeding if you stop moving. So, if you're hit with a bleed, find a safe piece of cover and wait until the effect passes, and you'll take minimal damage. You'll, you'll kind of lessen it all. This one is credit to that Reddit user, Micah Maelstrom, for figuring it out. <laughs> we did not. We will link that in the description down below. Now, next at number six, it's important to know that mod effects do not stack. Because it might seem like a good idea to put more than one of the same mod on a piece of equipment, but unfortunately, if you do that, you're basically just wasting a slot. Mods effects of the same type don't stack at all, so even when it feels like they should or it looks like they should, uh, they don't. Sometimes in certain instances, the slot will turn red and tell you, but sometimes it doesn't at all. On top of that, uh, vulnerabilities don't stack in the game either. Any effect that makes any enemy more vulnerable to something will only reset the timer on that effect rather than multiply it. Now next at number five, here's something to keep in mind. If you basically complete a quest, even if you all you have to do is turn it in, if you change your world tiers at any time, then your rewards for completing the quest will go down. Sounds kind of confusing, right? Yeah, the, the world tier stuff took us a minute. Uh, the thing is, anytime you lower your world tier in the game, any active quests will lower their rewards to match whatever the lowest tier you have set at any time for the quest. So you can't, for example, lower the difficulty for one section and then turn it back up again and expect to get rewards that match the highest tier you played at. Any reward you get always defaults to the lowest, even if it was only for a second, and even if the quest is entirely done and all you have to do is turn it in. If the quest is still considered active and you can still get a reward for it, then the reward will get worse if you drop the world tier. This is probably in place so players can't game the system and just play through a mission at world tier one, then bring it up to world tier seven or eight at the end, right before turning in the mission and get a big reward. Still, it might be a little too punishing, I don't know, everybody's kind of different on this. The game is still figuring itself out. Just a reminder to turn in your quests when you're done with them so you won't ruin your rewards at the end by mistake. Next at number four, know when and when not to use cover. I know that sounds really obvious, but this game is a little weirder than you would expect. Considering how it plays in the early stages, don't get too used to always keeping yourself glued to cover. This is of course depending on which class you choose, but don't build up a bad habit of relying on cover too much because very quickly the game starts to throw a shit ton of enemies at you that all wanna flank you or rush you. So sticking to cover can kind of screw you over quite a bit, unless you're in a very specific situation where everybody is directly in front of you. You kind of have to break your brain a little bit if you're used to playing other third person shooters, maybe something like a Gears of War that relies on the cover so heavily. Not quite the case here. Outriders wants to get you out and about using your powers and having fun, so get used to that quickly. Now down to number three, this is a simple but important thing that's not very obvious and is never explained in the game. When you're dismantling, keep this in mind. It's always better to sell a common item rather than dismantle it. This is because common items only give you scrap when you dismantle them, which is the same thing a store will give you for it. Only if you dismantle it, you'll get a fraction of the amount the item would go for in a store. You're kind of ripping yourself off. Here's an example. You know, these gloves sell at a store for 48 scrap, while if it's dismantled, you only get 12 12 scrap. It's nice if you want to clean up your inventory in the field, but you're missing out. That's like one quarter of the value. So eventually common items won't be worth picking up at all, but when you do, be sure to sell them and only dismantle them when you run out of space. 
Now down to number two, when you start dealing with items that have rare or better, uh, you're often going to be seeing some kind of mod attached to them. These mods tend to significantly improve some aspects of your playstyle, and because items can't be traded or are instanced to your character, they're always going to be useful for your class. Like seriously, these things can be amazingly good, and if you combine the right ones with the right abilities, you can become an absolute killing machine. If you want to get the most out of mods, then take the time to disassemble every weapon and piece of armor with a mod attached that you don't plan on using as that will give you the recipe or the ability to use that mod on something else. Even mods that don't seem useful at first might become incredibly good when combined with certain other ones. So having as many mod options available is possibly only a good thing. And from reading around, it does seem like trying to upgrade weapons to keep up with you is usually more expensive than it's worth. This is early game, so we don't know for sure, but in situations where you've got something really good and you wanna hold on to it, it's mostly better to just bite the bullet and dismantle it to get its mod than it is to try to improve the weapon in the crafting menu to stay at your level. Generally, just take the time to look at your mods and dismantle anything with a remotely good one instead of selling it. Now down to number one, if you're not playing with people, set your lobby settings to closed. This is something that we've already seen a lot of people complain about, so don't let this be you. The lobby is set to open by default, even after you've joined up with friends. As long as there is room, it's possible for players to join. So if you want to avoid having to kick players you don't want to play with, be sure to switch your lobby settings to close after forming your team. And while lobbies are auto set to open, you can also go into the setting and change it so that they default to closed if you don't have any interest in playing with other people. And that's fine. We're like that most of the time. This is a game that uses peer-to-peer -peer connection, so if you are playing online, there's probably going to be some frustration if both of you don't have really good connections. So for this game, at least, it's probably better to just stick with your friends and avoid playing with randoms. That's just our opinion, though. And of course, these are some tips if you're starting out, just some things that we wish we knew early on along the way. If you guys are playing Outriders, though, feel free to leave other tips for players in the community down in the comments. We found this game to be surprisingly interesting if this is your type of thing. If you enjoyed this though, and maybe we helped you out, maybe you got a good tip from us, clicking the like button is the best way you can help us out, dude. We would really appreciate that. And if you're new, consider subscribing, maybe hitting that notification bell because we put out videos every single day. But as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys next time.